quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, this is going to be... I think the show of the year when we consider who's in the studio. First of all, Hemp Meadows is sitting across. Well, you're actually not sitting across. You're sitting next to me. In the house, In baby. the house. In, in the, the house. In, in the podcast uh, studio here. In the studio. What a studio. Sitting across from us is a gentleman that I have actually known vicariously over probably the last 15, 20 years or so. All right. Uh, which makes one of us or both of us old. We're not sure yet. <laughs> Al Bowman, who is the creator and executive producer of Producers Choice Honors Red Carpet Press Events. He's also done the, I want to try and make sure I get this all right. The, your, your list is so flipping long. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> he has produced the Los Angeles Music Awards, the Hollywood Fame Awards, and the Phoenix Music Awards for two decades. He started a more streamlined operation and award show production, uh, utilizing the basic formula of many of the biggest award shows in the entertainment industry. Uh, this new event series allows each recipient to be specially chosen through a discovery process using an online system of music evaluations. And from what I understand now, you're bringing the show to Nashville, Tennessee. Absolutely. Al, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. And it was a shocking thing to know that a name as good as Nashville Music Awards was even available. Nobody had taken it. Nobody had taken it. I couldn't believe it. You know, mm. then I, I made a relationship with a lady at City Hall because I went because I wanted to double check. I like I couldn't believe that that this name wouldn't be mm -hmm. taken, you know, and uh she said, no, darling, it's, it's yours if you want it. So we turned it into a um, corporation with a merchant account and turned it into a business. Obviously, it is one. But the most important business that we're doing now here is, is the uh, nonprofit foundation to teach artists the importance of focusing on their exposure factors. That's the thing. You've got to get in front of the media. Nashville, it's an interesting place. There's, you don't see a lot of red carpets here. Why is that? You see a select few of them. Very yeah, few. A very select few of red carpets. And, it, and it, you're right. It's not, not a, a large plethora of that. But before we go there, let's go back to the very beginning. <laughs> oh, boy. Al Bowman, you and I actually crossed paths. I don't know if we officially met, but we crossed paths uh, at the L.A. Music Awards in Los Angeles. We think it was 2012, 2013. We're not sure. Could have been too. Was Keith Olsen there that night? That was 2011. We had like the Seinfeld guy, Larry Hankin, the actor. That would have been the year oh, I that's was there. That's right. Okay. Okay. The, yeah. so, that was a good year. We had some very, very good celebrities that year. And you, we had you, a ton of media on the red carpet that year because we were honoring Michael Jackson's band. Uh, like Alex Al, the bass player, we were honoring the drum. We had his whole actual band members there, and we were expecting Michael Jackson's kids to show up as well. So we had E! Entertainment out there, and I don't know if you remember the red carpet, but I that do. sidewalk I do. was packed with mm -hmm. media. With what we call the grip and grin, or the step and repeat, the, right. the, the, the yes. backdrop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that was a great red carpet that year. You know, Again, that's what it's all about. Yeah. You know, At the end of the day, artists have to understand you got to get in front of the media, and that's... Yep. That's the name of the game, that you don't get popular any other way. I'd like to know if there is another way to do it. <laughs> well, if there is, it may just not have been discovered yet, and <laughs> the time is right. We're always trying to make them discover it, but you know, sometimes they're their own worst enemy. You know. How did you start this? What was your, what was your impetus to get this awards show started back in the day? Things, significant moments in your life where something happens and it just 
either a split second or a couple of minutes, something takes place. But it all started when I drove in my limo, because remember, I had a limo service. I had 10 years full time running limos. Uh, at one point, I had 10, wow. yeah, 10 Amazing. limos rolling 24 7. It was a tremendous amount of work, but at the same time, you know, when you love what you do, it's not really work. <laughs> it's so funny you say that because I actually drove limos for a few years. How do you like this one? Yeah, amazing. Back, back in, the, in LA, uh, uh, yeah, in late seventies, early eighties. That now that was the inf that was the infancy of the limo business. That's before. The Reagan years when the limousine business just yeah exploded. these were the old wow. Cadillac you know for former... the old a big big body Lincoln style yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they, I drove all the old Vicks. Cadillac parlor now, who cars. Who was your primary clientele back then? Because by the time I got into, it, I had Chippendales Girls Night Out, yeah, a lot of celebrities, yeah, a ton of rock stars, right? Ton, sure, you know? and the prom business just seasonal. You know, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, prom, prom, yeah, prom. Yeah. You're making you know four most or five hundred bucks a limo. You know? Most of the clients I drove for were professional gamblers and we would take them to Santa wow. Anita or we'd take them to Del Mar. Okay, the racetracks. Yeah, that was the big thing that we would do. Take Occasionally the, the basketball games or mm -hmm. the baseball games. Yeah, but man, live action. Yeah. yeah when, when I started Funtime Limousine in 1982, there were only 43 limo companies in California. And today there's over 15,000. There used to be 18,000 when COVID killed off a lot of the, those companies. Let's get back to the award show. Okay. What... What was the first award show that so you did? The first one was because of Whitney Houston. I was driving her, and then she asked me if I was a seat filler for this at the Shrine Auditorium in 1983. Uh, a seat filler at the Shrine. So she was there for, she was nominated for a couple of things for that I'm Your Baby Tonight and a couple of other. Sure thing, man. Yeah, and so she, uh, and, and she was very young, extremely beautiful. I mean, mm -hmm. My goodness. I've know? heard that about Whitney. And she, she also spoke. You know, it's so strange how she ends up dying from a, a drug overdose because that woman was as clean as I ever seen any person, you know, she spoke in um, a lot of, you know, hallelujahs and oh, praise the Lord. Oh, it's a beautiful day. It's a, oh, that's Well, Sissy this Houston the day was the, her mom. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, she minister? grew up in the church. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Absolutely, so man. Whitney was a church girl. She asked me about this. So I go, she tells me how to do it. And apparently she knew about this seat filler thing. Okay. So I go and I, they take a Polaroid at the time and a paper application and I'm already in a tux, you know. So they say, okay, we're going to sit you down, you know, in the first, on the sixth row, you know. Do you know what a seat filler is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they don't when... want to show any empty seats when the camera sweeps right. the room. That's right. Someone gets so, that. So they the have these people, good looking, attractive people who look like they belong there. Right. You know? That would be you. Yeah, in a always, You're already in a tux. Already there. And, and, and I'm and, <laughs> sixth you know, row. Right. right. And I'm driving Whitney, who's a new, this is her first Grammy nomination. Ah. Yeah. Wow. She just broke out, you know, in a, early 83 or yep. late 82. And so this happens and, and I'm like, wow, OK, I never heard of this, you know, because now it's called SeatFiller.com and anybody can do it. But you still got to be very attractive. They sure. don't want you to be right. ugly. You know, right. you got to look good. You right. got to dress nice. Then they'll leave you in the lobby and they go, OK, Britney Spears just left. Let's get uh, you and you. You guys go sit. That's the way they do it. Fascinating. So they moved me around a bunch of times. But the first time I get sat down... I get seated next to Patty LaBelle, and I happen to have my limo card with me, you know, so Working if you ever need a limo, give you a call. Then they move me again, and I'm sitting next to Brian Wilson, the Beast Wow, Wilson, you Brian know, Wilson. Who I end up becoming friends with, and then have this crazy thing that happens the night that Dennis Wilson dove after something that somebody dropped in the water. That's when he died. And drowned. Drowned. And I was Fantastic. in the vicinity on that fit, that fateful night. So this is stuff that happened. And it started when Whitney Houston got me the seat filler gig. And then I was able to actually see up close what an award show production looks like. There you go. And so from that point on, seat filler would call me, my office landline. And uh, and if I wasn't there, I had a company that would then beat me that I would then call into. To that see was who the called. day. Remember that? <laughs> the remember sky that? pagers. Yeah. Right. The sky beep, pagers. Beep, beep. Yeah. Oh, I got to call my service. Yeah. You know? and so, yeah. The big deal. You're uptown yeah. when you have those. Yeah, right. exactly. Remember it's that? a sign okay, of privilege. Good. We're man. having good memories here. Okay. So I start getting calls, you know, for not only seat filler gigs, but people who are using the limo, then I would contact seat filler and go, hey, I'm going to be driving so-and-so at the Oscars if you need a seat filler for that. So then I go there and I see Billy Crystal host. I end up seeing uh, Johnny Carson host. 
And I'm just like, wow, you know, this is. Do you see the entrepreneurship, the way he's working the oh, angle absolutely. there? Absolutely. It's fantastic. Yeah. So I And up, you're seeing, you're going to these shows and you're getting to see the way they're producing right. the show up close. Yeah. Right. For years before I, I start one. Because when it leads to the finality of why I stopped the limo business as a full time occupation was because the LA riots. I got caught up and I lost two cars that night and I saw my city get pretty much destroyed. Mm. So, yeah, but that that's why I got out of that racket, but, uh, or excuse me, that business. And then I uh, did the, I started the first award show because Bill Gazzari was really bummed about the emergence of grunge rock because it completely wiped out the Sunset Strip. Like and that. we should probably elaborate just a little bit yeah. for those young people. Right. Gazzari's on Sunset Strip was the place, probably one of the two places. Right. One of the, the two places. The whiskey and Gazzari's. And but they Elmer Valentine, yeah. who owned the whiskey, hated Bill Gazzari hated and Bill vice versa. Yeah. And I mean, this is before the Viper Room. This right. is yeah. before the China Club. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Gazzari had his venue open from 1960 when it was Mama Gazzari's as an Italian restaurant with a supplement of live entertainment till it closed under Diane Gazzari, his niece. She, mm. she couldn't keep going because once he was dead, it was yeah, gone. Yeah, it was over. You know, yeah. and uh, what so What year he, was that? Do you know? 91, 91, he died. okay. Yeah, he died in March of 91. And just before he died, him and I sat down at the Rainbow because I was, I dropped someone off from the airport and I said, hey, I'm going to go down the Sunset Boulevard and see what's going on. And this is March of 91, okay? So the Gulf War has just concluded after like a month and a half, all okay. right? And uh, this emergence of grunge rock has come, where suddenly it went right. from Motley Crue, Skid Row, Poison, these all kind of hair bands, big hair bands, to all yeah, of a sudden the this thing strip. called Nirvana, another band called Soundgarden, another one, you know, called Pearl Jam, and then it grunge took came, over. It took and over destroyed for about the strip. five years. It destroyed yeah. the strip. It destroyed. There Live music was one gone. person like I'm. Yeah. It was like a ghost town, literally. And you know, it's one of those things you never forget because you're like. I was here where it. you couldn't even move down the street because right. they were flyering right. every car that goes right. in. Oh, the, man. the sheriffs in there to direct your traffic. <laughs> you got 10,000 band members trying to promote Everyone their on the show street. on the paper yeah. flyer. Amazing. Remember? And uh, so, uh, and, and that particular night, uh, which I believe was March 3rd, 1991, I end up as the only guy in the rainbow with Bill Gazzari. And he's sitting there and he's drinking coffee and he's shaky and he's got these bed sores on him. And I'm looking going, this guy does not look long mm. for this world. And so wow. I ask him, you know, to, to talk to me because I'm like, Bill, what's up with the strip? It's, you know, and he goes, hey, limo man. I was known as Al the limo man because of my supplying of the limos. To, so that was my we all need a, a trade name. Mine was Al the Limo Man. Hey, Limo Man. You know, so you remember how Bill talked? Remember he used to, he did his own commercials, remember? I'm Bill Gazzari, the godfather of rock and roll. I remember and you were the Limo Man. And the reason why, it, this guy was like the personal driver for Motley Crue for yeah, a couple of years. Yeah, you want to Google my name alongside any na famous stars. Whitney um, Houston, he okay, drove her. Yeah. So did you ever take them to Tommy's Chili Cheeseburgers on Roscoe Boulevard in the middle of the I night? I did. I did. Yes, he did. I was there that night. See, how do you like it? You guys, well, that was the night that Tommy in the Lee. Morning. Yeah, you should yeah. have met Tommy Lee. A hundred times in a before phone now. Booth. Tommy Lee wanted to get some blow, and I, I can't even imagine Tommy Lee wanting to get <laughs> no. some blow. And he, he's like, dude, I need some blow. You know, he calls me because I, dude, you know, I admittedly, and you know, you come and arrest me, but I don't have any drugs with me now. So you got to have drugs, have evidence. But I used to, you know, uh, do whatever I could to keep clients like that happy. And I did admittedly <laughs> deliver blow in the middle of the night to many clients. Something that Mr. Lee needed. This is a great story. <laughs> he and knew, I admittedly. I, admittedly, he could be I it all admit, up. Hey, I don't the have the drugs now. The statute of limitations you know, is do? worn I, off, right? It doesn't right. matter. I'm just going to sit here and drink my iced yeah. tea. And... But I know. But I go, and if Tommy is sleeping. There was, I was in the studio. It's like, we're going to make right a call. There, Who are you calling? We're calling Al. That's we're calling, calling Al the limo guy. Yeah. 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 Hey, man, I so, need some that's blow. limo man, not limo guy. Limo man. Al the limo guy was another guy. Not the non-binary limo guy. So anyway, but what happens is that right that same location there was a phone Roscoe's. booth because we used to use those back then yeah so for like sure. a plexiglass with uh, yeah. aluminum mm -hmm, framing mm -hmm, i yeah. remember what one looked like mm -hmm. <laughs> so tommy is sleeping in one of those with the phone receiver hanging down oh. <laughs> at that roscoe's location at uh, the roscoe location of the of, of the tommy, uh, tommy yeah. Yeah. 
And it's that's so funny you said that. Wow, what a what a crazy, Gosh. It's just a serendipity. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, again, I, and I gave him his what he needed to wake himself up, and he was very happy and gave him a ride home. And his car was still running. Uh, and while he was passed out in the phone, man, booth. amazing. And you know those those were the days. But yeah, I did. Um, I was Motley Cruz limo driver uh, for three years, and uh, between eighty four and eighty seven. But eventually, like all those rock stars, they end up buying their own limos, and then it's bye bye. You know, we got to move so, on to other. So you know, clients. we were talking about Whitney too. Uh, you drove her for a long time. I did. I drove Whitney for many years, uh, starting in nineteen eighty three, off and on. I'd say. Um, by the time I took her to the premiere of The Bodyguard, it was seven or eight times. And um, and I, I think I got to drive her in some of the most significant things of her life, which was uh, in the round at the Forum when they put the stage in the middle of the room in the round oh and rotates. Gosh, that right. show. And 1987. Wow. And I was very lucky to get to drive her at that time. And, you know, it was a different world back then. You know, people yes. behaved, you know. like It was a different world. Because there'd be a thousand people waiting at the top of the ramp the forum okay you know for her to come out in the limo yeah and they were all nobody was like banging the windows or throwing stuff or trying uh, to kill each other you know like, yeah <laughs> the world was much more conservative and nice she was such a star prior to social media turning everyone yeah. into a moron so you had her in the back seat and with also with bobby brown probably on occasion uh, no just I, on that last that last time in 1992 now i did come out of retirement in 98 to drive her to the airport because she asked for me strangely enough wow now, that whole story gets back to those moments in life where you meet somebody and they change your life. This was Harold Berkman. Okay. Uh, Harold was the president of MCA Records. Uh, he was mm -hmm. also uh, an entrepreneur with the limo business. He started Music Express Limousine. Mm -hmm. And he had the inside on all of the music stuff. So he was guiding me in, let's say, around 1984 when I met him. And he started guiding me on how to build clientele through the record industry, which was to be using delayed billing. So you send an invoice and you wait four to six weeks to get paid because most people arrive with the limo, they want cash up front. Yep. But when you're driving Whitney Houston, got to build a label. And so and you got to wait for your money. It's all recoupable. Right. And it was a good, it was, and it was a all good bills to the artist. Yeah. Oh yeah. It worked really good for him because he was already wealthy and he had, you know, 40 cars that he owned, but he was always booked and he had to farm out. And I was very lucky oh, that, yeah. that he chose me to farm out, and then he makes 20% of the run sure. without having the liability of the ownership of the car, you know? So that's my job, you know? And so this is how I ended up building a lot of my clientele was from Harold Berkman. God rest his soul, that man was a genius. And um, Well, you probably picked up a lot of things from listening in the back seat, too. Oh, I think, uh, how did you know about from, that? From stories well, to, to business insight, well, you know, you I mean, know, watch I, deals I go down or be negotiated or whatever. little intercom system with a little speaker box. Yep. If I was driving a Doc McGee and he had Deb Doc Rosner, McGee. the publicist, yeah. and they were sitting in the back and John Bon Jovi was there. Which, Legendary again, manager. I'm, I'm sort of hypothesizing. Yeah, I would turn it on because I want to hear their strategies on publicity and what they're talking about. And you get the publicist, the manager, and the superstar in the car. You know, I want to know what's going on. Wow. I want to know what they're talking about. The publicist, the manager, and the superstar in the back seat of the limo <laughs> talking. Talking. You better have both hands on the steering wheel at that <laughs> yeah. point. And your ears wide open. Well, a lot of that stuff, you know, and I learned a lot. You know, uh, no you doubt. remember? Do you remember a, a company? I, I know you're going to know it. Faces International. Oh, yeah, absolutely. George Goldberg was my client. He was the president of Faces International. He had to be the most genius level because he it was just a magazine where you char he charged like 2500 bucks for a black and white headshot, you know? And he, he was this thick and it was volume one, volume two, volume three. Right, right. He raked in. What was his secret? Oh, I've learned from the best. Wow. George Goldberg had a phone room where he had five people calling those expensive clients, telling them that they saw their picture in Faces International and they're doing a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they loved their picture and they want to let them know that they saw it. And each of those clients who, even if they got one call, yeah. We're just ecstatic, but he'd make sure, like, if you spent 10 grand and did the full color spread, full page with, like, inset photos and in color with your headshot behind all that, those clients, they got, like, five calls that somebody saw their picture. It's Hollywood. It's Hollywood. And yeah. so I well have... Well said. Yeah. 
It's, it's Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> it is. So, yeah, you want to know stories. But really, it gets back to Whitney Houston got me that first seat filler gig. I was able to study my first award show. And from that on, subsequent from that day, I'd say I attended over the next 10 years somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 40 to 50 award shows Amazing. of all kinds. Grammys, American Music Awards, Country Music Awards. Golden Globes, Directors Guild, Producers Guild, uh, every kind of guild, Screen Actors Guild Awards, multiple times drove Martha Ray. Martha Ray, the big mouth. You know, people have forgotten about these kind of iconic individuals. Sure. You know, because now everyone's an Instagram star. Oh, Snapchat star. The I difference didn't know was... then was they were legends. Right. They were, they legends. were living, walking, living talking legends. legends. Yeah. yeah. Especially From a her. different era. I mean, she was before our time, but we knew of her. Yeah. She was we on knew the of tail her end. Because of our parents. That's right. Yeah. Now, yeah, let's see if you remember legends. this name, yeah. Bob Bender Johnny Grant. Oh, the mayor of Hollywood. The, the honorary, honorary mayor. The honorary, honorary, honorary mayor, mayor of Hollywood. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you Grant. a rhetorical question. Did Johnny Grant, as honorary mayor, have more power and influence than the real mayor? Well, I think if you wanted to get a star on the Hollywood <laughs> Walk of Fame, you had to go through Johnny you Grant. 100%. Yeah. 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 And Did I pass know, the test? Yes. Hey, guys like this are so largely forgotten, but on YouTube, there's a video called Johnny Grant Goes to Gitmo. I did two tours with Goes Johnny to Grant. Goes to Gitmo? You mean? Yeah, yeah we did a- we Guantanamo did a, Bay. Guantanamo yeah, we did, Bay. We, we did a, a tour uh, two times, um, uh, Johnny and I. He did a third one, and I think that's what eventually killed him, because he was the Grand Marshal of the Christmas Parade. At Guantanamo uh, Bay? It, yeah. Wow. Yeah, in 2007, and then 2008, he passed. So let's back up even a little more. Johnny Grant had a talk show. Prior to? On, yes, on, on television on and radio. And I believe, if KTLA. I'm not mistaken, he was in the movie... White, White Christmas. Christmas with Bing Crosby. Yes, baby. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's pretty good. You, you know, yeah. you're Johnny Grant. There's too. a lot of things that just doesn't leave this mind. My wife, she might disagree, but yeah, there's some things that just well, stay in there. Well, there's some things up there that are rattling around that she wouldn't have had disturbed, except you're talking to Al over here. Yeah. And what a coincidence you guys have had. Uh, so many it's amazing. things cross. Uh, Johnny Grant and Bill Gazzari were the two most important Johnny figures Grant in my life for doing Gazzari. the award show. The inspiration from Bill, because the night that Bill and I are at the Rainbow, he, I sit with him, we're talking, and he, you know, and he's, he's just bitching about everything, you know. Ah, that goddamn grunge rock. Because remember, I'm Bill, glad he's not alive to see what's going on today. If Bill, Bill invented go-go dancing, cage girls. Bill invented the, the big hair. Fishnets and five inch heels mini skirt look of the 80s. Wow, it's a classic look. It came look, from Bizarri's, man. It's one of the best in the, the business. Big hair with sparkles in it. Love it. You know? And then the fishnets with the real short skirt oh, and the five stop inch it. heels. <laughs> that all came from Bill Gazzari. The first ever go go dancer was in Bill Gazzari's. And he puts her in this cage that he built. Remember, Bill was very hands on. Like if the toilet was busted, who'd fix it? Bill. He didn't hire plumbers to do anything. Bill, I mean, Bill ran that club. I hate to say it because at the end it was really a, it needed a lot of help. It needed a lot of love by then, yeah. Yeah. It did. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's how it all started. Whitney Houston to Bill Gazzari and then Johnny Grant comes on board with me in 2004 and we become good friends. He died in 2008. So for the next few years, Johnny was giving me tremendous guidance in Hollywood. Wow. Tremendous. Mentored showing by the up, best. Showing up in 2006 for a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm doing my At seminal. show. Event. Wow, okay. He gets me Lisa Gibbons to be my host. <laughs> Remember her? I do. And uh, Entertainment Tonight, I think, wasn't she? Was yeah, yeah, she was the first year that we have Mike Kerb come. Okay. I had, that was my 16th year, it was my seminal event leading up to that time. From all the experience, that's how long it takes to get it down to where you're going to do a show where you can have 13 performances, 26 recipients, and it's power packed, and your schedule is like mm -hmm. right down to mm -hmm. like... 0.32 seconds. You know, mm. I think at the very end of that, we were six minutes off on the time schedule despite cramming That's TV all time that right there, content right? together. And that was the thing is um, you got to learn to master that side of things. A live event is an issue of timing. 
all the things about live events are, you know, okay, we got to make sure that curtain is coming down at the same time as the screen behind them and that the podium's lit and the presenter's already there and the recipients at the base of that little stairwell coming right up so we don't have to get them through the crowd, walking through and killing off. Because let's face it, 30 seconds at a live event is an eternity. You mm-hmm. can lose people from their tables. They will walk out. So this is the key thing mm-hmm. is, is no dead air. Mm-hmm. Like, those are my, my trigger words. And on that one, we had The Temptations, The Tonight Show Band, Three Dog Night, Ambrosia, Bruce Jenner when he was still a man with Chris and the kids. They were all there because we had um, Leah Felder, who's the daughter of, finish that, Felder, Felder. Done. Not correct. She was playing with uh, Brandon Jenner, son of Bruce. Right. Okay. So very, very serendipitous. Then they had Alex Orbison. Son of? Roy. Right. And at their table was Dwayne Betts, son of? Dickie. Right. I think I'm being tested here. I'm not <laughs> sure. I but can no, listen to this that, forever. That, that event had so much. And Trini Lopez, we honored that night. With son the t- of? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Right. and Mrs. Lopez. Yeah, exactly. so, but at that show, that was the seminal show. And Johnny got up on that microphone, and he made a joke about me. And Lisa was standing next to me. And he got a huge laugh out of 1,200 people at that music box making a joke about me. And I didn't know what to make of it. And then Lisa goes, hey, Al, you're somebody now. I said, what do you mean? She goes, Johnny Grant just cracked a joke about you and got a huge laugh from your audience. You're a celebrity now. And I was like, I'm What a, a great thing for her to say. <laughs> the joke was this. Johnny gets up there and he goes, Al and I met in prison, Guantanamo Bay. Al said to me, Johnny, we got to give you an award. This is when he's getting his award. And I said, oh, really, Al? Well, what would that be for? And then Al said to me, I don't know, Johnny, we'll think of something. (laughs) And the audience busted out laughing. And I did, again, and then Lisa said what she said, and I was like, okay, so that's how it works. So whenever you have this generation of younger people who can't take any kind of joke, they've killed comedy with political correctness. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a guy say in front of an audience of people that I got met him in a terrorist prison. And I laugh at it off, you know. You just got to learn to laugh things off. Well, Guantanamo Bay, I didn't even know that they had entertainment that was down there, but they've got troops there. It's like you're, you guys are like Bob That's Hope and the people coming life. down or something. I made nine trips in three years, two of them with Johnny. And over the years, I brought a film festival, a bunch of bands. I brought a thing called the Beauty Brigade, where I brought- That's got to play in Guantanamo. You know it, it does. It's 9,700 people, 400 women, the rest men. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> it worked. The, the circus, there was a movie out called Guantanamo Circus that's won a bunch of awards, and I'm in it, and it's on Amazon Prime. If you want to watch it, it's had millions of views, and, uh, and it's all about the time I brought the circus- to Guantanamo. Uh. And this was with much help from Johnny Grant again during those years, 2004 to 2008. Johnny Grant was a very significant influence in my life. And I'm glad that Bob has given us a chance to reminisce and remember guys like him because mm. he was iconic. We're going to take a break, get a word in from a couple of our sponsors here that support the podcast. In the studio with us today, Al Bowman and Hemp Meadows. Hi, this is Byron Nemeth. Check out my new episode on the business side of music with Bob Bender. You're listening to the business side of music. Hey friends, this is Dr. Garrett Hope. I am a speaker, coach, and composer. I am also host of the Portfolio Composer podcast and founder and executive director of the Ultimate Music Business Summit. The third annual Ultimate Music Business Summit is a three-day virtual conference that will be held on January 5th, 6th, and 7th, 2023. This three-day virtual event features over two dozen speakers to help you build your music business. As a musician, you care about your art. You want to make a difference in your community and in the world. You want to pass your knowledge on to your students. And you want to do more than trade your time for money and just get by every month. UMBS is all about the one thing you didn't learn in music school, realizing that you are a business. It offers dozens of ways to build a career as an independent musician, including marketing, copywriting, studio development, mindset, money, and networking opportunities. Whether you're a composer, touring musician, studio teacher, recording artist, or professor, UMBS is for you. Get your ticket now at musicsummit.biz. 
As a musician, you have a dream, that vision of what success looks like for you. Though it's not only about the money, money is part of it. Whether you've been extremely successful or you're just striving to maintain a regular cash flow, you need a plan. Money Concepts can help you develop a customized plan to achieve the financial stability and success you want. For over 40 years, Money Concepts has been providing holistic financial planning services to individuals, families, and business owners. As an independent firm, Money Concepts and their associates are committed to always represent the best interest of the client. It's really about a committed, benevolent interest in them personally. This independence coupled with that committed, benevolent interest means they represent you, the client, not a product supplier. It's not about selling products, it's about helping you achieve success. To learn how this can benefit you, contact my buddy, John Adams, with Money Concepts at 737 877- 867-9309. That's 737-867-9309. You can also email John at jadams at moneyconcepts.com. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm going to just say kind of a co-host today joining us. Him Meadows uh, is here. Thank, delighted to be here with you. What a great for setting. Setup, you were planning studio. on doing this. I you? had no idea, but yeah, here, well, here we are. Here we are. And then across Loving the it. podcast table from us is Al Bowman. This has been <laughs> a lifetime of, of catching up, of knowing a lot of the same people, working a lot of the same projects, attending a lot of the same events. And we all crammed that into the first 30 minutes. Uh-huh. Let's talk about what you're doing now, because you moved to Nashville mm-hmm. and you have created uh, an award show called the Nashville Music Awards. Did I get that right? That is correct. Okay. In addition to that, I started a nonprofit foundation called the Nashville Music Foundation, which will, just like the Grammys has the Academy, we will use that as our uh, vehicle to raise money to produce our events because we want to provide something to the creative community here at the independent level, Mm -hmm. because Nashville is very star-driven. It's damn near impossible for an independent original artist or band to get a gig in this town at any place. You know, there's almost 400 live entertainment venue licenses issued in roughly, you know, a 15 square mile area. (laughs) And and I want to say something. When you say 400, that is that's almost an understatement because this town thrives on live entertainment. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about places that serve liquor, food and have live music seven nights a week and are licensed with the city. The actual number when I signed up to get these names was 385, but they were all in a relatively small area. Okay. of Nashville and Davidson County proper. I'm sure statewide. I mean, geez, even in Tullahoma, there were like six places mm-hmm. that were open, on, you know, last week to uh, uh, catering. Even Winchester, Tennessee had two live music places. You so know? you're talking about original music versus cover bands or uh, tribute Well, acts. I'm talking about places that showcase live music of any kind, whether it's country, originals, or whatever. But if anybody who comes to this town, it, they find it almost impossible, you know, to get a gig. And because uh, every time I talk to people related to this town, it's always, man, I've always wanted to play there. So this is a, a real plus, uh, coming here and starting a program like this. Now, admittedly, there's already an existing Nashville Music Awards, but the problem with that particular group is they didn't protect the name. And I did. So, and I have no beef with them doing theirs and I'll do mine, live and let live, and let's all get along, right. you know? But, you know, uh, your old boss, who is very, very uh, close with me, that I really, really love as a uh, an associate in this business is Mr. Mike Kerb, because he is he is a workaholic, <laughs> and uh, but he kind of built this town. I mean, Kerb Holdings has quite a bit of um, property structures, buildings. You so. just go down Music Row, and what's left of the music entities? Yeah, right. Pretty much has a Kerb <laughs> logo on the side of the Correct. building. Yeah. yeah, it's true. You know, Mike is an amazing man. And over the years, like your paths cross him, you work for him. Mine did indirectly in many, many different ways. But mostly it was the admiration that just, I said, look at this guy. And then he's like, you know, I think I'll start a NASCAR team. Builds a quarter of a million dollar car. What happened that first year? Who won? 
Oh, that was, uh, let me see, was that? Uh, it was Ar- the year that Mike Kerb, his first year, Ar- it was, uh, won Earnhardt? the NASCAR championship Earnhardt with the was driving, car. Dale Earnhardt. I think Earnhardt was driving for him at one point. Yeah. Waltrip, Daryl Waltrip. Daryl Waltrip. Was from, one yeah. of those two National guys. But, guys. But he was tremendously successful at that, too. He just has that, I don't want to say the Midas touch, because. No, I think he, it does. It, it's, he has more, the it's more, touch, it's yeah. more uh, platinum than gold. Midas is for gold. Yeah. Uh, Kerb is platinum. He had 55 years he's had 300 number one hits two of them off the same song from two different artists correct leanne rhymes and debbie boone you, ah! you light up my life oh, wow. that's right and he did it twice you're right yeah i worked the latter i worked the the leanne rhymes that that record wow 1997 98 something like that yeah i have that debbie boone album and when mike got his star on the walk of fame in 2007 in front of the Capitol Records building, which was his choice to put it. Strange no enough, doubt. you know who put yeah. his star right next to his? Ringo Starr. Wow. <laughs> when, years later, when he got his, it was put next to Mike Curbs, and, I, which I find just crazy, you know. Um, but that day we had Casey Kasem there. It was Debbie Boone, Pat Boone, and Casey Kasem and me. And at that point, I realized, you know what? And I don't have to say this braggadociously, but I'll tell you that coming off of that Sunset Strip were the five most important people in terms of influence of rock and roll. They were, in order of importance, Mario I put first because he owned that rainbow since the early 70s. It was called uh, Cafe Villanova. It's where Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe first met. So then there was him. Then there was Lou Adler, Elmer Valentine, Bill Gazzari. And yours truly. Okay. So on that day, I realized I am the fifth most important person to ever come off the Sunset Strip because I built my entire LA Music Awards brand from the Sunset on Strip. The strip. I did my, my showcases at the Whiskey. You know, and from year one, I did my first ever LA Music Awards showcase. It was one of the last events that was held at Gazzari's, you know? And so. In that moment, when I was there with, with Debbie and Pat, and Pat's like, you do the LA Music Awards? I said, yeah. And he goes, I have this band I want you to hear. <laughs> and I was like, "For sure, really? Pat Boone is shamelessly promoting a band? And him and, him and uh, Mike sat together, and he kept telling Mike, I've got this band, i got this other band, and i got a new song I really want you to hear. And they were having lunch with Tom Wally, and, uh, who at the time was the president of Warner Brothers. And the, that was my life in LA. Uh, that was a great time. The next year, Mike came and accepted the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Phoenix Music Awards. And then in 2009, he made a substantial financial contribution to that event, uh, the 19th Annual Los Angeles Music Awards, to honor his sister. And if you look online, there is a Carol Curb documentary video on YouTube that I wrote, produced, and narrated. And it's very informative about her life. Mm -hmm. Carol Curb documentary look that up she is of course married to dr norman nimoy who's a world-renowned neurosurgeon at cedar sinai anyway what are we doing in nashville well with with the inspiration provided from people like mike curb and the discovery that the name nashville music awards was available we started it we did three events this summer uh we did it in a place called the parlor as a warm-up place beautiful room that hemp meadows is familiar with the scene and and uh, done stuff in himself some video stuff and then the the electric jane which yeah i think is the best venue in nashville the whole room is designed to put your attention onto that stage mm-hmm. where that artist is mm-hmm. performing Brilliant. okay second thing the owner jason is from los angeles he's mm-hmm. on bardot at the avalon upstairs he owned a place called the green door in L.A. as well, and a couple other places where he was owner or part owner of. Well, the thing about the Jane is, is that it's kind of like the Roxy in the sense that it's a nightclub slash supper club where you can see a great show, where you've got world-class lighting, production, uh, a theatrical opportunity to present and perform. So for the local showcase side of the Nashville Music Awards, it's the ideal venue. Yes. So let's talk about the Nashville Music Awards. It's coming up. Yes, it is. We're in the middle of a campaign right now, and we welcome anybody to submit to that uh, for consideration of nomination. We've taken all our categories down and consolidated and done spinoff categories of them. 
it used to be I had 40 categories with five in each category. That it was about 800 personalities that I had to deal with. Mm. And uh, now it's, it's, there's a rock category, but then it spins off into rock artist, rock single, rock album, rock male performer, rock female performer. Country, same thing. Mm -hmm. Spinoff categories. So there's five. Basic categories okay. with spinoff categories from each. It, it's opened up the possibilities that we could hypothetically honor hundreds of artists this year with the presentation of a certificate of nomination on our red carpet. That red carpet photo op is the most undervalued, underestimated, and underrecognized tool there is. Because let's look, if you have a plumbing problem, you need a tool to fix it. Well, let me let me interject here because a lot of people don't understand this. The red carpet in Nashville, publicists and managers will work to get you a slot to walk, walk the red carpet, mm -hmm. and then go home. You don't go in to see the show. Right. You just you you stand. Oh, very is that true. Right? It's the kind of the wow. step and repeat, grip and grin. Get yeah. your photos done. Okay. Right. People do not understand the impact. They don't get of that red carpet photo. Thank off. you, Man. Bob Bender. He gets it. Yeah. Now in our case. I'm I'm very fortunate because I own my own red carpet, which is a 30-foot custom-made red carpet with our logo cut into the middle of it with different color carpeting, threading. It's very high-end carpet. Paid thousands of dollars to own this thing. I own my own stanchions. I have four 4,000-watt halogen lights that flood that thing with light because you've got to have it. It has to really, like, pop, okay? But the key is the press walls. That's mm -hmm. what you want to look really good. Mm -hmm. In Nashville, you can get the silk finished background to put those logos on. Because, again, what's the value point? Well, when you take a picture, like in the case of Olivia Newton-John, God mm -hmm. rest her soul. She was one of our recipients a few years ago mm -hmm. when Bose was renewing for the second time. Now, the first time they were more part of the Rock Gods Hall of Fame induction thing mm -hmm. in 016 because I was getting inducted with with Michael Anthony from Van Halen and several other notables. And so they were coming back to renew and they were like, well, we need more this time because that rock gods thing was cool, but we need to get more. Well, we do this thing where Olivia is on the red carpet in Vegas and gets interviewed by this show that's on Fox. It ends up on national TV and then it's repeated. Then it's posted on YouTube and you see right there, Bose professional sound right behind Olivia's head in that prime piece of real estate co-branded mm -hmm. with the hard rock cafe logo. Cause that's where we were holding the event. And then Bose is like, we're in forever. Our What's boss, that worth? our boss saw that on TV and said, wow, great use of money hmm. for mm -hmm. this new department they created called brand the building event. at its best. Yeah, yeah, their event marketing Visibility department. They didn't even seen have by that. Millions they just signed three employees to this, and it was yeah. And so that's who I was working with. But they finally got at the end. They go, oh, okay, well that that's good real estate. And then I started thinking, hey, you know what? That eye level placement of that logo, that's a pretty valuable thing right there, you know. And that it was it all because of Olivia, you know. Like there's been these super, and she's a superstar. Okay. Like totally. The time of the superstar. Whitney, superstar. Olivia, superstar. She was so grateful. She took pictures with every independent artist that was there. Because remember, our format is one that combines the independents with the famous folks. Mm -hmm. The famous folks are what helped bring the media. So by proxy, those artists get on that red carpet and have the media that came to cover a Mike Curb or a, any number of notables. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I like to get, you know, uh, big and rich guys. And, or, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, anybody I can get that are, that's big that would want to um, support the independent artists and bands. Because we are all about inspiring the future by honoring the past. That's what we're all about. We're going to get another word in for another one of our sponsors who help support this show. And we're going to find out how you can get involved with the Nashville Music Awards show with Al Bowman and Hemp Meadows here. This is your boy, DC, the Brain Supreme of Tag Team, and you're listening to the business side of music. Whoop, there it is. You're listening to the business side of music. 
Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhance Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. When you have a Korg synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth. Korg gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, Al Bowman, who is the executive producer of the Nashville Music Awards. It's coming up uh, here shortly. We're going to talk about that. And uh, Hemp Meadows is sitting across the table. And one of the things we were talking about during the break, Mm -hmm. among many things, Mm -hmm. was the independent artist and how this really benefits and, and affects them. I don't think you can overstate the power of publicity and promotion for an independent artist. It's the holy grail. It's the hardest thing to achieve. I mean, the, the, there's so many independent artists and there's so much talent and so much creativity, and yet it's so hard to get anybody's attention. And I know for a fact that there's fabulous music that's being recorded and even released that never sees the light of day or has a limited audience, and it should be huge. And it never gets a chance to have that kind of visibility. So if you're an artist that's out there and you've got a, a, a great record, you're on Spotify, you've got some social media, you're playing some gigs, things are working for you, and yet you're finding it hard to go to the next level. The key to that is PR. It's just publicity. You've got to raise yourself above the crowd somehow. And some of that you can pay for, and some of that is organic. Some of it's organic, but what I found is, is that for the most part, in order to be able to get publicity, you're going to have to pay a publicist. Well, and that's what I was going to say. You need both of those components. Yeah, some of it is a happy accident because, as an example, you know, we got on Fox TV and we had the opportunity to do well and we became known to them uh, because of a good friend who's got a show on Fox and who had us on and it was an interview show. When they had an opportunity for the uh, CMA week to come up and they wanted to do a live remote from Alan Jackson's, they needed a band to do that. And we got the call because they knew us. And that was a freebie from having been on TV because we were on TV but that's, earlier. That's serendipity that we're right. talking yeah. about. Yeah. But the main thing that we have to do is, is you've got to pay a publicist to that has those connections that you don't know how to get and that you don't have. They've established themselves as a, as a conduit to the press, which would be articles that could be written about you, TV appearances that could be made, uh, podcasts that you could be on, right. all the opportunities to gain exposure, but you're going to have to pay a publicist. See, and the, our thing is we're event-based exposure. Yeah. We and, know and so to create I, an environment where the press will gather. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, if you're trying to make in this business... You have to accept that this is a popularity contest, and the only way to truly get popular is to be in front of the media. Bob, you know, companies, I, I'm going to drop this name. You'll see if you know. Getty Images is a company that specializes in paparazzi stuff where they take pictures of celebrities and they put them on the Getty Images website. If you're an independent artist and Getty Images just put one, just one, photo of you on Getty Images website, chances are, depending on what your last name is, there could be Steven Tyler is on that page. Paris Hilton might be on that same page. Nicole Kidman might be on that same page. But the fact is that other celebrities are going to be on that page with you as an independent who was always, up to that point, what we would call a lesser known independent artist Mm -hmm. who's not lesser known anymore because... 
the web crawler will grab the information that you're on Getty Images under your name. When people start going, well, who is this guy? And they Google it, and it's like, he's on Getty Images. How do you get on that site? Let's, let's remember this. What is the term in real estate that people use? Location, location, location. In the entertainment business, and especially the music business, it's publicity, publicity, publicity. Good publicity, bad publicity, it doesn't matter. That's why the cancel culture, I kind of laugh. I always go, God, please come and try to cancel me. I could use the help. Is there any way you could put some protesters out in front, too, and sprinkle it, and then I'll call the news and make sure they come down and cover it? <laughs> well, I think the value that... that so that's how you have to do it, you yeah. know? That I heard was, uh, in fact, the way that I met Al was from a, uh, a really good friend of mine I've known for years. We used to play in bands back in L.A. Uh, he lives in Las Vegas now. And he met Al because of becoming involved with the, one of the, the award shows mm -hmm. as a contestant. And went through the nomination process. Yes, he did. And uh, became nominated for a couple of different categories, I think in the Americana yes. category, and wound up winning. Yeah. Uh, but even being nominated was a huge thing. Got him a tour. That gives you got, him all, an, you got paid Exactly. Going out there. <laughs> it gives you an opportunity to say, hey, I've been nominated. And then if you win, he said, this is unbelievable, Hemp. I was able to be interviewed yes. on the red carpet was live. I got a video of me being interviewed on the red carpet. I got photography. I got videoed being on stage doing my showcase performance. And then getting the award presented. And then I got a video of me being awarded my award on stage. So he said the PR value of that was just unbelievable. I was able to start getting un great gigs I never would have been able to get because I was able to go, hey, I got an LA Music Award, I got a Las Vegas Music Award, and he was able to put that on his reel, and he was able to promote the crap out of it. It's amazing. Yeah. So let's talk about the show. It's coming up when? Okay, so we have a, a series of ongoing events that we do throughout the year. Okay. Once a month called Nashville Music Awards Showcase Series, and it's put on by the public relations company through the entries that we get from online. NashvillePRG.com, Nashville PRG, that's for Public Relations Group, NashvillePRG.com. You go there, and then on the homepage is a, a way to get into the process and submit your music. We listen to everything. And we did an inaugural uh, launch last month with a Music Connection magazine, and we were able to get a real good metric on exactly the number that go out, the number of people that open the email, the number of people that then click and go forward into the process, and then the number of people who enter from there. And so we really got a good measure of that. So now taking that and applying it to these music platforms that are online, and there's a lot of them. So I'm going to ask you an industry-related question because I think you might have the answer to this. Years ago, I'm talking about two, from 98 till 2009, we used a thing called MySpace. I'm sure you remember. Right. right. And we got into a thing called Sonic Bids and then Reverb Nation after that. And those were our mainstay online platforms to drive the submission process where people pay a fee to upload their music and, and, or send us a link to their existing page. Are there now less artists than there were 10 years ago? Or are there more platforms than there were like Deezer and Bandcamp? And the waters are very very diluted these days now because there's been you're right reverb nation sonic bids yeah. myspace right those were really kind of the uh that was the wild west back then right mm -hmm. and we don't really have a standalone per se right. that can take the place of those entities and nothing against like reverb nation or sonic bids i i i personally i miss myspace a little bit because i thought it was, it was a, great for musicians it was a great little great platform player for musicians. on there that worked you got good audio on it you could just play videos yeah it was good we're all focusing so much now on youtube and and TikTok and instagram what about the art of the live event is it still alive well i i think yes and no but I think as long as we focus on those platforms I just mentioned, and look, we use them for our show, uh -huh. but the, the art of the live show is something that is very difficult to replicate in, in a one-dimensional setting. And when I say one-dimensional, like television, you know, uh -huh. and getting discovered that way, I see artists on YouTube that have 4 million, 5 million, 10 million streams or downloads or looks views and that's great you know how many people have actually heard of you and have you lasted more than five minutes 
And I think- Or would show up to see you live. Or would show to, you're you're right, would show up to see you live. So those are the- Those are the things that we have to remedy, that we have to fix, and there has to be a way to create that impactful moment that that independent artist needs. That's the Nashville Music Awards. Right, because it's it's an event. Right there. It's an event-driven. The whole thing is about get. I mean, I I can't... However you get there, you know, as P.T. Barnum once said, a terrible thing happens without publicity. Absolutely nothing. Right. So, you know, (laughs) and at the end of the day, I mean, you know, because I hear artists say to me, well, that sounds good, but we're working on right now our social media. We're working on our, uh, you know, our YouTube views and we're trying to get more exposure through our Instagram account. And And you know what? And that's great, but it's not enough. Let's just really simplify it. Remember when I said the waters are diluted? Mm -hmm. It's because we have so many social media platforms. You can't keep the attention span of these people for more than seven seconds most of the time. Why do you think TikTok has 15 second or 30 second little increments? I know. Or, yeah. or Instagram. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. You can't build a devoted following and a fan base that will come to your shows and buy your music and buy your merchandise right. on those platforms. You have to have something else there. I'm just going to leave it at well, that. Well, you know, yeah. if, you, if you look at it, uh, movie studios, they all have a department that is strictly dedicated to making sure that their movies get recognized at the Directors Guild Awards and Absolutely. the Golden Globes and all that. The Golden Globes formula was very simple for a very long time, which was everybody was equal until one stepped up with bigger support than the rest for the Golden Globes, meaning, well, we have these producer circle tables. And they're 10,000 each. So when you have Ben Affleck nominated for multiple awards for Argo, for example, and I know this to be true because I was, I was immersed in L.A. at this time and was involved in this. He bought the four $10,000 tables up front and he won all the big awards <laughs> because that's 40. Sure. Because they're spending, they're spending probably 70 to 80 bucks a plate on the food to the Beverly Hilton. It's usually a chicken breast with rice pilaf and some vegetables and maybe a dessert with the logo cut in the top on a chocolate. But the fact of the matter is, is that. I've been to a few of those. So, <laughs> yeah, right, you know, about, so yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, they just want to know, OK, well, you're all equal to each other. Who's going to step up and really support what we're doing? And then when you do that, that's always who. It's how they get recognized. It is. Yeah. Yeah. You have to support yeah. like, OK, well, if you want an Academy Award, isn't it? Don't you have to, have to like buy all those ads in Variety and Hollywood Reporter for your consideration billboard right. mm-hmm. up on Sunset Well, and it's the same thing in, in the in the billboard awards and the AMAs and the CMAs. And yeah, it's all sponsor it's, it's, it's driven all, and it's, it's money driven. You got to support. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so like, you know, your your former boss has always been gracious enough to come to every event. And he agreed that this inaugural event, he said, I'll be there to accept the first ever Nashville Music Award Lifetime Achievement Award from you. That's what Mike said. I told you you could be the presenter, but I don't know. This guy seemed like he might. <laughs> How about you two do it together? You could come out of the crowd and go, hey, Mike. <laughs> yeah. W- wouldn't that be funny? Well, ask- when was the last time you saw him? Uh, 2000. Christmas of 2003, I think. Wow, oh, really? Gosh. That long ago? Well, yeah, I left the label in four. And yeah, haven't but seen him But you never see him sure. around? Or, uh, no, been... we don't travel in the same circles. Really? Because, yeah. I mean, I would, okay, well, you know. I live, on, I live on Division Street on Music Row, and so right around the corner from me is this Mike Curb School of Music right. administrative building. Then yeah. there's a Curb recording studio on one corner with the big fake guitars in front. Yep. And then there's Curb Corpor- Incorporated, another corner building, massive building, nobody there, completely empty. But his main one over on Music Square, it, it, towards downtown, in the heart of downtown, where Becky Judd works. Now, was Becky, she was working for him oh, yeah. back then. She's still at it. I How, love is Becky. Is she going to yeah. be 100 when she retires? I love her. Yeah. You do? I do. Absolutely. She's a great yeah. lady, man. Well, ask Al about the process of the-, the Yeah, so the, let's the, talk the, about that. Okay, we, I know. We keep getting out of my Share, share with, with him about the way that you've got this yeah, thing so staggered question, with the events yeah. and the shows and the So I'm an, ind- I'm an independent artist. I want to get involved. I want to- be a part of this. You want to be on the red carpet. I, how do I, how do I go about doing this? Okay, so we have very simple process, and uh, I did a lot of testing to make sure everything worked for all the systems in place. But at NashvillePRG.com, there's a submit button, and you submit. And what we don't we don't ask for an MP3 or upload anything. It's going to take a lot of server space. We just want you to send us a link 
to your music. Now, that link could take us to an album. It could take us to your YouTube channel with a video or two videos. Uh, I like it when it takes me to a full playlist of like 10 songs is what I like to do. Because sometimes that 10th song is the best one. And then you ask the artist, they go, well, that was our least favorite song. It's like, are you kidding me? That should have been the first song. And they go, <laughs> right. And that's part of what we're going to do with this PR company is help them, guide them with these like, hey, get your arrangements correct. Let's let's help you with your artwork. We, we're going to have staff to help do all that. Mm -hmm. So once they do that, they go online and they just up. They don't have. They just send us a link to their music and pay a forty dollar entry fee. That's really an evaluation fee mm -hmm. because we're going to take the time to actually listen and start filling our categories of nominees. We want twenty five performers at three and a half minutes each for our showcase series. We want five celebrity judges. Because if you can get five people to agree on something, or at least three out of the five, you've done something pretty good. And, I think and this one of will the other determine if the artist gets to go on to the red carpet. Yeah, and, and their music will be evaluated. They like, will get to be lot heard of, live and not just scored. a song. This is we have a scoring based. system we've developed. Yep. It's all there. We worked really hard on this. He'll tell you, he's been following the process as both artist and observer, right? I mean, you, you have. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's really great is because I've entered, you know, song contests with NSAI and different things, yeah. uh, you know, ASCAP or whatever, and, and uh, you don't know if you never get an answer back. You know, you, there's not even we a have rejection 200 letter. winners. Think about that. If you win a nomination in one of our categories or a spinoff category, that's the win. Yeah. Because when you come to the showcase, to we're giving you a certificate of nomination that you can frame. That's tangible. Or we're also going to send you the digital copy of it as well for place it on your website and show right. that you've been at, recognized here. Because I got to tell you, Bob, you know, the name Los Angeles Music Awards, great name. Hollywood Fame Awards, great name. Phoenix Music Awards, Pretty good name. Producer's Choice Honors, Las Vegas Fame Awards, all good names. But this name, this is international appeal. Nashville Music Awards? I mean, you know, it actually really means something. And it's not a coincidence that every single artist that I've spoken to, and I know a lot of them, have said, I've always wanted to play in Nashville. We can give them two gigs because the warm-up gig at the parlor is a great chance to network and meet mm -hmm. the other contestants. And, you know, if need be, Bob, we are going to build this on out-of-state and out-of-country bands. If the locals are skeptical because they've heard this or that, or that we're just going to build it and we're going to bring so the tourists. Open, it's open to everybody. Open to everybody. Yeah. I really want to run through somewhere between 8 and 20 Nashville artists that pay the entry fee, and then we take over and help them through the process using the foundation as a community service to help them get through the process where they don't, they're already local, so they don't have to pay travel costs to get here. You know, they're not buying airline tickets and making hotel reservations. So we can help those Nashville singer-songwriters, particularly the country and the rock, because it's one and the same here. <laughs> I see these bands, yeah. you know, I saw a country metal band uh, last week, country metal, and I'd never seen anything like it. He took Rob Zombie and mixed it with Johnny Cash, and he did it correctly. He took Folsom Prince of Blues and mixed it with White Zombie. So, you know, it, it was, I'd never heard anything like it. And, and it was called, he was called Cody Parks in the Dirty South. And uh, I, I just couldn't believe how. So it's not genre specific. It's not no, just about country music. No, I love the originality. Yeah, These are the kind of artists we want on our stage who are yeah. innovative and breaking new ground. Right. Submit your material. Original Someone visionary like that, artists. That guy would get nominated. But I'm making him follow the process. And I'm teaching him yeah. to trust the process. Step by step, get in. We're going to help you. We're going to do a, a series of ongoing events that you can participate in. And each right. event will have a red carpet set up at mm -hmm. it. Each event will have the opportunity for you to be photographed and build marketing tools. Mm -hmm. You need tools. If you got a publicity problem, you need a tool to fix that. Mm -hmm. If you got a plumbing problem, you need a tool to fix that. Mm -hmm. If you broke a furniture leg, you need a hammer and nails to fix that. I think that. it's the missing it's element for most independent artists. Thing. Yeah. It yeah. is the key thing. And, you know, you're doing your part by, by having me on and, and having this guy who's been watching and seeing how it's going to benefit his incredible music. This guy's music is so good. Oh, thank oh, you. He's one of the best. He's, he literally is one of the best. So remarkably good. Okay, you know his song, Stay? I know all of his okay. music. I play it all the time. Is that right? I love your music. Oh, oh. I've listened to the record so many well, times. Blame them and him. You it's, take <laughs> me back to a time that I wish we still had music right. like that. Right. Ah, wow, okay. Okay, here it is. 21st Century Sergeant Peppers, right here, this yep. guy.
Yep. 21st Century Sergeant Pepper, the, one of the greatest rock albums ever made. And Great you analogy. emulate that. If you take his song, Stay, he uses the Beatles thing. Because the Beatles, what did they, their commonality of their hits was what? That the first words in the song are the title of the song. Whether it was Hey Jude, or Yesterday, or Help, or A Hard Day's Night. The, the song had the hook and the lyric and the phrase, the first line of the song. So his song, Stay, you only have to hear it once. And it stays and you're with hooked. you. Yep. <laughs> and wow. that, and that's you. a remarkably written song. And the video is even better. And that will be the first independent award ever presented at the Nashville Music Award will be for that video, which we will play on a flat screen, big screen in front of the stage at the Jane. We will play that at the Electric Jane and let people see oh, what an awesome. award-winning video looks like because it's not just the video. Because remember... When MTV first started and they had the Music Video Awards, yeah. in 1990, yeah. they changed it to the Video Music Awards because suddenly, after a few years, a visual overlapped the audio. People don't just listen to music anymore. You got to admit, you probably hear, hey, Bob, have you seen that new song? Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Have you seen the new song? No, yeah. I heard it. Do I have to see it too? Yeah, because nobody makes songs anymore without a video to accompany mm -hmm. it. These young artists got their dad or their rich Uncle Bob to put up money to make a video album. And it, there's thousands of them on YouTube where it's 10 songs, 10 videos. So it's a different world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm discovering that during this process. But we want to encourage artists. If you're watching this, we have a great program here. We can get you in front of the national media. You need to get that red carpet photo with a, a, a logo stamp from Snap for You or Getty Images or one of these paparazzi companies. Because can we talk about the, the laws here about paparazzi? The reason you don't see a lot of red carpets, it is illegal for a photographer to follow a celebrity and take their picture in Nashville. I did not know that. That's why I could run into Carrie Underwood and her husband at the turnip truck. And we're talking, and I'm, I even said to her, I go, you know, if this was L.A., there'd be 10 guys on motorcycles <laughs> following you and scooters and any way they could get to you mm -hmm. to pho mm -hmm. photograph That's you. True. Yeah. You know, and Not plus, I, I played it off a little bit because I pretended more to recognize him, Mike Fisher, because he plays for the Predators. Yeah, right. So I acted all groupie-ish over him. And, exactly. And That's I, the way I said, to do it. Yeah. I said, is that your sister? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, so, but, you know, I, and she said, well, you know, she's the one who told me. She goes, well, you know, they can't do that here. I go, they can't. She goes, why do you think all the celebrities are coming here? It's a felony to stalk a celebrity with a camera. And then I went to City Hall and I said, hey, I want to put a red carpet on Division Street in front of this place. Oh, we can't do that. No, 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 no. We're gonna be photographers? I said, well, of course, it's a red carpet. Oh, well, you'd have to get approval. You'd have to go to a city council meeting. You'd have to get a vote, 5-0, or at least four to one, if you're lucky. She said, because we don't do that here. We don't do that here. I've been hearing a lot so of that in Nashville. <laughs> so I said, well, we have an enclosed patio, case solved. So it's private. Yeah. 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 That's what you need. The electric chain has an enclosed private patio with an eight foot wall. And that is huge. You've seen it. It's a beautiful setup. Beautiful setup. I'm looking forward to a this. great really club. Am. This is going to be Well, great. I think we're going to probably have to give you some. We'll do the Johnny Grant thing. I don't know, Bob. Let's come up with something. <laughs> no, but you're, you, you've done a you've had a remarkable career. You've helped a lot of people, Bob. Yes. I mean, you're, your life has touched a lot of lives in a good way. Yeah. In, it has in many ways. It has. You got great kids, and you know, really proud. You know, just to mention Bob, Bob's kids. Uh, he comes from a long line of great military people, mm -hmm. and uh, both my wife and I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's really awesome because you know, you you wouldn't see that in L.A. You know, you'd be like, oh, no. it comes from a long line of gender studies professors. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having us on today, man. It's, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for being on. Hemp, always a pleasure to have you on Thank the show. Thank you. What a wild surprise to be on your show. <laughs> and getting I've always all that wanted to do it. How great yeah, you are. and at the end, By it was fantastic. I'll tell you, it was <laughs> That actually trip. mean it, yeah. <laughs> that actually mean it. That are sincere. That's great. Thank you so much. All right. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.